Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to get started in, in just a minute or so. I'm just going to give everybody a couple minutes to just filter in. Um, but thank you for joining us. And, and while we're waiting, if you'd like to, um, feel free to go ahead and, and put in the chat where you're tuning in from. Uh, we know we always have viewers from all over. We love to see where everyone's at um, in the U.S. or even outside of the U.S. Um, so go ahead and put that in the chat and we'd love to see it. Whoa, Alaska. Wow. South Dakota. Oh my gosh. Colorado. I'm in Colorado. Hi. <laughs> Kentucky, South Carolina. Hi, Troy. <laughs> Tennessee, Pennsylvania. Wow. We've got like half the states already. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Okay, it looks like we've got a good number going. So I think we could go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Catherine Swery, and I am the content marketing specialist here at ACHS. Uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, for the webinar, Somatic Approaches to Befriending Stress. This is part two of our stress, stress management series. Um, and leading today's talk is ACHS professor, Lisa Warman. Um, Part one of this series was hosted earlier this week by Dr. Jackie McGrath. Um, so if you didn't have a chance to watch that, I will go ahead and put the link to the recording in the chat box. Um, so you can feel free to check that out later because uh, these two really do go hand in hand. Um, uh, before I hand it over to Lisa, I do just wanna share a couple of housekeeping items really quick. Um, you may have noticed that your line is muted um, and we are recording today's webinar. Uh, so having your line muted helps us ensure for better sound quality for everyone who views the recording later. Um, if you do have questions or comments during the presentation, go ahead and put them in the chat box at any time. Uh, we love to see your questions and, and we'll try to answer as many as we can um, during the presentation. Um, if you're having any technical issues, I'll be working behind the scenes today. So go ahead and send a message to me in there um, and I should be able to assist you. Uh, one thing to note about the chat box is that you'll notice there's a blue drop down menu. You want to make sure you have that set to everyone instead of host panelists. That way everyone can see uh, your questions and comments. Um, and with that, I think I will go ahead and hand it off to Lisa to get the presentation started. Thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate that introduction. And I would just like to reiterate that, yes, this is a two-part series. Uh, Dr. Jackie presented part one. And if you happen to have missed it, um, Catherine's going to put the link in. So I, I certainly encourage you to view that when, when you have an opportunity. And a lot of what Dr. Jackie presented in part one uh, built a foundation for what what I'm going to talk about today, because as an English teacher at uh, American College of Healthcare Sciences and teaching research writing, I always encourage my students to make sure that whatever it is they're talking about is rooted in science. And uh, as a yoga teacher, I just believe that all of this works. Um, and I just want to go out and tell the world that all of this works, but uh, we need to have the science behind it. So. Uh, Jackie was the root of all of this, and now I'm just adding some of the um, somatic approaches, and we're actually going to do a little practice today, so hopefully you'll participate in that. So as K uh, Catherine mentioned, I am Lisa Warman. I am a professor of English. I'm also the director of the Peer Tutor Center here at American College of Healthcare Sciences, but in my role today, I'm coming to you as a certified yoga meditation teacher. Um, not as an English professor, because we are talking about something that has really nothing uh, to do with composition or, or writing. I want to credit, firstly, um, a couple of my um, instructors and mentors from the Himalayan Institute in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Carrie Demers and, and uh, Sandra Anderson. And with them, I have learned essentially this idea that um, our physiological and neurobiological perspective of 
how our biology embeds habitual patterns also provides us an opportunity for transformation. So this again is a follow-up of some things that uh, Dr. Jackie was talking about um, that we have the capacity as humans to rewire our neurobiology. And so kind of what I'm talking about today will, will lead us uh, to a better understanding of that, I think. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is how stress affects our parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, again, Dr. Jackie gave us a great groundwork of, of that and, and really the physical and physiological effects of stress, um, but also how yoga, and when I talk about yoga, I'm talking about the eight limbs of yoga, not just asana, but also for the uh, context of today, asana, pranayama, and meditation can help us befriend stress. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science behind stress, um, recap a little bit on the polyvagal theory, discussing how yoga is an option for befriending stress, uh, most importantly, talking about breath training, and then we will have a bit of practice together. So when we're talking about somatic yoga, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing this everywhere on social media, social uh, somatic yoga, somatic um, Pilates, somatic exercise. So I thought it would be important to kind of wrap our heads around what this means. So the somatic practice of yoga in particular is a practice that integrates traditional yoga uh, with a focus on an internal experience, uh, experience, connection with movement and the sensation that leads to a heightened awareness of the inner space of our body. Swami Rama is the founder of the Himalayan Institute and also the author of uh, the, the book that I've used for my referencing, The Science of Breath. And Swami Rama professed that all of the body is in the mind, but not all of the mind is in the body. So I think that what I really want to showcase here today is that we know that there's a mind-body connection. I see my students talk about this all the time. So <laughs> I know the majority of people who are, are probably on this webinar understand that. But what we need to understand is that if the body is in the mind, how do we make sure that the mind is in the body so that the mind can sense what's happening in here? There's so much information of what happens and what has happened even more importantly in our lives through our experiences and these uh, the effects of these experiences and memories and situations causes stress and it causes stress in our body physical stress physical imperfections physical issues um, and Dr. Jackie talked on it um, slightly about trauma as well. I'm not here to talk about trauma. That is not my wheelhouse, but um, there is a there is a connection there. And so when we use these somatic approaches in which we get our mind more connected to the body, we get information and we have a better ability to rewire our neuroplasticity, to make changes and to help heal ourselves. So I know this is a huge concept, um, but hopefully as we go along, it'll, it'll become a little bit more, more believable. And to become more believable, of course, we're gonna talk about the science. So the nervous system, it evolves in all humans to support life, right? This is, this is what we learned in, in part one. It's, we're hardwired for survival. We're hardwired to find fire and to protect ourselves, right? That That's what we did as cavemen. So our lives are not that as extreme for most of us for, for survival. I do want to say that I do know people in North Carolina who are still struggling to find heat and to find water. So, you know, in a sense, they're living their lives right now in a very stressful flight or fight system in this caveman mentality of, 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 of survival. So. I just wanted to do a little shout out because um, I feel really bad for those people. Um, 
to be without those main things that we need for, for survival. But once we get out of that flight or fight uh, capacity, we are have the ability to change how we respond to our experiences and to alter the effects of stress. And so in order to understand this a little bit better, I, I love this uh, image of the uh, triune brain, which I got from um, Dr. Demers and, and Sandra Anderson. And it talks about these three parts of the brain. At the stem of the brain, the reptilian brain as we refer to it, this is our instinctual or dinosaur brain. Then moving up a little bit, we come to the limbic brain. This is also referred to as the mammalian brain. This is our emotional or feeling brain. And then at the top is the neocortex, our rational or thinking brain. So to take this a little bit further, the reptilian brain, this is what governs our unconscious life-sustaining functions, breathing, heart rate, balance, eating, sleeping, procreation. It's the part of the brain that takes over when we're stressed or in danger. It's what prompts us to breathe, to eat, to sleep. And its typical mindset is, am I safe? It's linked to the gut, the gut brain, right? So you know when something's not right, you feel it in your gut, your intuition, that's re related to the brain, right? So we've got the mind and the body, we're already seeing this connection. Next, we go to the limbic system or the mammalian brain. This is our emotional mind. Um, it's emotional because it cares that we are socially connected. Um, as mammals, we're herd creatures. We, we care about our social connection. And this is the part of the brain that is strongly linked to flight or fight. But also, if you think about it, these are other things that we feel when we're disconnected. Um, anger, jealousy, love, resonance, compassion, attachments, right? These things sometimes get a little complicated. And we feel afraid when we're disconnected from the group. The typical mindset of the limbic system is, am I loved? And this is linked to our heart intelligence. Then the human brain, the neocortex. So this is our rational, uh, critical thinking mind, right? It's creative, imaginative, it has capacity for reasoning. And this is the part of the brain that allows us language, abstract thought, risk assessment, executive function, discipline. But what's awesome is this part of the brain can override levels of the triune brain. Right? So it can help us think, oh, what can I learn from this? What is meaningful here? And I liken this to uh, going to a haunted house. So if you're going to a haunted house and you're walking down and there's this long hall and you see that there's a turn, well, if you've ever been into a haunted house, you know that there's danger around the turn, that something is going to scare you. So even though you know that that's going to happen, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to be frightened. But what it does mean is that you can anticipate what's going to happen. You can prepare yourself and that um, term of fright may be shorter, right? It may be m minimal. And so this was what's so cool about this part of the brain understanding, right? So if we learn to understand that our brain functions in this way when other things happen, we can start to program ourselves, say, oh, this causes me that. I can prepare for that. Um, a, a personal example for me is moving. I've had to move quite a bit in the past, 10 years and I get a little manic <laughs> when I move. And so I get into this flight or fight state where I have to have everything boxed, everything labeled, everything packed. And then on the flip side, I have to have everything unbacked, everything unboxed, everything put away. And so I know that when I'm going into those situations that I'm going to be stressed. This adrenaline is going to be running high for quite a, a bit of time. So I need to know that once I come down, I'm going to need to have some time to rest and digest. Right? So, so this is how my, my human brain is 
is uh, sort of fighting off or offsetting the effects of the way the other parts of my brain function. So how does yoga <laughs> affect our nervous system? Well, it helps us to cultivate self-awareness internally and externally. We learn to catch ourselves, as I just mentioned, acting from our reptilian brains and our mammalian brains. And we begin to understand how survival drives our automatic responses so that we can overdrive those or underdrive maybe our automatic responses. And the general um, centers addressed in yoga, which are quite interesting, are the gut, the pelvis, the heart, and the mind. So the anatomic nervous system, Dr. Jackie already previewed this for us, so this is a review. It governs all bodily functions, heart pressure, heart rate, um, liver function, kidney function, digestion, immunity, hormone regulation, pregnancy, and it is divided into two halves, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is the flight or fight. This is when our nervous system is active and we are directing energy out into the world. Um, we're working, we're doing, we're thinking, figuring things out. It can be stressful and it may trigger an adrenaline response. Doesn't necessarily always have to be bad though, right? At its most extreme, it's this flight or fight, but we also need to have energy here or tone or activity in this system to stimulate the mind and the body. And so the body is ready for action, the mind is alert, and we sometimes need that right, to, to engage, to play. Um, Dr. Jackie and I were talking about, you know, this flight or fight, we had to get our slides done by a certain day, right? So um, these are things that help us meet deadlines as well. Right, so, so as humans, we, we need this. On the other side, we have the parasympathetic nervous system. This is our rest and digest. This is where when we have more tone or more activity in this part of our nervous system, our energy is directed inwardly. This is to support our digestion, our immunity, cellular repair, rejuvenation. So you're starting to see how more activity and more tone in this part of the nervous system helps us to repair ourselves. This is also where our mind feels more calm and relaxed. It's more able to assimilate experience. We can consolidate memories in our past. We can choose to look at the good rather than the bad. One thing that's interesting to note is that our experiences seem to have um, different ways that they affect us. For example, our negative experiences are more like Velcro. They stick, they're more hardwired. And our positive experiences are more like Teflon. They don't last as long. And so the more time we can spend thinking about our positive experiences, the more we can get them to stick and to resonate. And the less time we focus on those negative or Velcro experiences, they can start to kind of wither away. So this brings us all to the polyvagal theory, which is a theory uh, brought forward by the neuroscientist Stephen Porges. And Porges states that the parasympathetic nervous system is governed primarily by a pair of nerves called the vagus nerves. So when there's more tone or more activity in the parasympathetic nervous system, there's more vagal tone. This is good. Porges expanded our knowledge of the anatomic nervous system by describing two branches of the vagus nerve, the dorsal vagal complex and the ventral vagal complex. The ventral vagal is good. This is where yoga comes in. This is what we want to develop. This is what we want to focus on. So understanding the polyvagal theory has implications for stress management and trauma recovery. Again, I'm not a trauma expert, there is science out there to support that. 
Strategies that promote ventral vagal activation are deep breathing, mindfulness, and certain somatic body work, such as yoga, which can help shift individuals out of these defensive states into a sense of safety, calm, and connection. I thought it was very interesting that on uh, during Jackie's webinar, there was a little thread going on about practicing yoga in a group versus um, alone, and that they um, the, uh, um, the participants were talking about that they felt more of a connection and it was more beneficial to them. I thought that that was a nice reinforcement to, to what Borges is saying about the ventral vagal complex. But before we get to that, the dorsal, right? So this is old, this is exists in all vertebrates. It causes immu uh, immobilization and fear like the possum syndrome. And I think that what happens is, is if we get into that flight or fight too long and we can't come out of it, we stay, right? And so this is where we start to feel feelings of threat, uh, collapse, shutdown, unhealthy coping behaviors, despair, hopelessness. And it's connected to the lower GI tract. So this is why when people are stressed, they often have GI issues. It's connected mind and the body, the stress in the body. The ventral, right? This is good. This is this is new according to, um, it's new to us. It's new in theory. Um, and Ford just calls this the, the vagal break. And that's vagal break. It puts a damper on our sympathetic nervous activity. He refers to it as the social engagement system. And when this system is activated, we feel safe and connected. And it helps us to prevent anxiety or fear. So in my mind, if I'm in the haunted house and I'm walking down and I'm coming to the corner and I know that something's going to jump out at me and scare me, right? I can feel safe because I know it's coming. It might be scary, but I know it's there, right? Yoga practices activate our ventral vagal complex and help create a more, um, more vagal tone, more vagal activity. And we feel safe and calm and regulated and have a healthy balance. We feel resourceful. And this is similar to something that Jackie shared. So I'm, I'm just kind of going to go over this a, a little bit here. But so in this green, right, this is the ventral vagal. So when there's more activity here, where this is in our parasympathetic nervous system. And so as we mentioned, right, we need this flight or fight because we're hardwired for survival and we all have deadlines and we all have due dates and we all have exams that we need to study for or presentations to prepare for. And so it's good that we have to, we have this kind of activation going up in here. But what happens is if we don't know how to come down, we go too high and we start to freeze and then we get stuck up here in the dorsal vagal. This is the bad <laughs> emergency state as he calls it. So what happens is when we learn to bring ourselves into a sense of a parasympathetic nervous system to activate, to have more tone in the parasympathetic nervous system or the, the ventral vagal, we can bring ourselves down so that then we learn to kind of just go with this ebb and flow between social engagement, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic without getting too out of touch, out of reach. And as I mentioned, ventral is good. The ventral vagal is good. Activity here is possible when we feel more safe and open and relaxed. Um, it's also a strategy for survival and practices that include deep, even breathing, which is pranayama in yoga, um, help increase uh, vagal tone. We learn to cultivate a relaxed receptivity for life. We're more open to larger versions of ourselves, curiosity, self-awareness, inner awareness, creativity, just overall general possibility. So yoga is a solution. See, I told you I would get to that. Uh, yoga develops skills to encounter the neurological, physiological, and psychological predispositions to stress. 
asana, breath training, regulate survival instincts, stress response, negativity, um, disconnect between conscious awareness and our inner states. And changes in the brain can happen during meditation. This, this happens over a long period of time. This is not something that I'm just going to say, oh, you meditate for five minutes, you're going to start rewiring your brain. This is something you have to do. This is a practice. This is why yoga is a practice, because it's never ending. You never get to the end. You're always, always doing it. Chronic stress reactions impact our physical mental health. Yet we have the capacity to learn, to breathe, to relax, to cultivate a clear, calm, and tranquil mind. The practice of yoga is an embodied practice. And it, it's not just something we do, it's something that we live, it's something that we feel, it's something that we become. It becomes preventive as well as prescriptive. It helps us yield resiliency, self-regulation, adaptability. And we learn to le live skillfully to rest and digest and to make peace with our lives experiences, whether they're in the past or, or, or whether they're around the corner. Um, I think it's important that when we talk about yoga that truly understand where I'm coming from in terms of the eight limbs of yoga. And as I mentioned a bit ago that, you know, yoga compa uh, compiles more than just doing asana, right? So I find that in the West, most people that come to yoga practice, they only know asana. They, they're coming for postures and they think that that's, that's yoga. But um, according to Patanjali, the eight limbs of yoga, asana is number three. Before, before we even learn asana, uh, there's the yamas and the niyamas. The yamas are restraints. These are moral disciplines or um, moral vows that you learn to practice, to bring into your life. For example, the first one, ahimsa, means non-harming, non-harming to others, non-harming to oneself. The yamas are positive duties or observances, things that we learn to do and not to do. This all helps with our karma. And then asana postures, then pranayama, breathing techniques, pratyahara, sense withdrawal, dharana is focus, concentration, and vayana is contemplation and meditation. The three highlighted are what we're going to do in our practice today. So yoga is a practice for stability and integration. In the neocortex, we practice meditation. We direct our attention, develop presence of mind and concentration. We contemplate to connect with the limbic system. We practice the yamas and the niyamas. We learn compassion and gratitude, service. And then in the, the brain stem, the reptilian brain, we practice asana pranayama and meditation to improve the presence of mind and create resilience and flexibility to, to things that happen. I think it's really important, and, and this is a really big concept, so I was hesitant to bring it in because it might open a whole other thing, but it's just important to know that there is um, this idea of emotional coupling with the breath, and that our breath is most affected by pain and stress and negative emotion. And what happens is over time, this non-voluntary way of breathing becomes our um, automatic way of breathing. Right? And so it's known of coupling of emotions to the breath. It becomes a habitual way of breathing and influences the physiology of the body as well as the mind. But with training, we can uncouple the emotions from the breath. This is another way that we learn to rewire our, our, neuro, um, our neuroplasticity. So if you think about it, you know, somebody will say, oh, it took my breath away. Or perhaps you've been watching a suspenseful movie or television show and you, I do this all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't been breathing. It's been so, so suspenseful. I, I forgot to breathe. And then I recognize that I wasn't breathing, right? So if you think about like things that happen to you and you, it affects your breathing, that starts to become 
automatic. Right? And so when we learn to um, train our breath in a more um, healthy way, in a stronger way, by strengthening the diaphragm, by breathing into resistance, it helps us become aware of these habit patterns. We, we learn that, oh, I'm not breathing correctly and I can learn to breathe the way that I should be in an effective, optimal diaphragmatic way. We want to avoid shallow breathing, chest breathing, holding the breath unconsciously, uneven inhalation and exhalation or loud or, or rough breathing. And we learn to develop a regulated breathing through optimal diaphragmatic breathing. We learn to ground our awareness in our body. We create a new habit of being in the body in a conscious way. We bring the mind into the body and then the body back into the mind with the breath. You may have heard yoga meaning yoke, yoking the mind and the body with the breath. This is what we're talking about here. So without breath awareness, we're just going through the motions of practice and, and our breath becomes mechanical. But with awareness, cultivated by observing our breath, we can begin to create new supportive patterns of breathing so that healthy diaphragmatic breathing becomes our new habit. We practice, we strengthen, and with repetition, this helps us to break old breathing habits. So in optimal diaphragmatic breathing, we focus on the five qualities of breath, deep, smooth, even, quiet, and continuous. Continuous meaning like a circle. I'm wearing a circle. There's no beginning, there's no end. And so if we can imagine the breath as being one continuous circle so that each inhale leads into an exhale without stopping, without restarting, and each um, exhale leads into the next inhale. So that there is no pause, there is no gap. So we're back to this purposefully. So how does yoga practice affect our nervous system? It helps us cultivate self-awareness internally and externally. We learn to catch ourselves acting from our reptilian and mammalian brains. And we would say, oh, I see you. I can do something about you. And we begin to understand how survival drives our automatic responses so that we know that these are coming and we know that we're going to need to find a way to rest and digest on the other end. And hopefully you understand that the practice of yoga connects to the gut, the heart, and the mind the same way as the mind is wired to connect to the body. So we're gonna do a little practice. I would love for you to um, clear some space so that you can lie on the floor. You don't need to see me because I'm not gonna be doing what you're doing. Um, but I would love for you to practice by, by, by lying on the floor. And, um, and then after we're gonna return to a chair, a seat um, for a little asana. And then we're gonna end with a little seated meditation. So I'm gonna give everybody just a couple minutes to Clear some space and get yourselves comfortable. I'm seeing some comments in the chat about post-traumatic stress and I'm glad that Dr. Jackie is um, referring to those because that's a whole deeper level, right? And that leads to trauma too, but um, yeah, this can definitely help because I think what happens is when we start to do our breath training and we start to get a better sense of what we feel in our bodies is that somehow, you know, anything that we're not connected to um, clearly in our bodies, that, that there's a, a sign that there's some sort of something there that some sort of post-traumatic 
experience has lodged itself there. And it could be a physical trauma or it could be emotional trauma. And what happens is through these practices, we learn to acknowledge that there's something there. Hmm. We learn to accept that there's something there. And then often with, with help, we can learn to take action about what is there and help us to clear these spaces out. So um, I, I would like to, to mention that as we go through these practices, if when I'm guiding you with the breath and we're gonna take a little tour of the body, that if you find that you have difficulty connecting to a certain part of the body, don't, don't belabor that, just make a little note of that. That might be something that you want to look at. Okay, so hopefully I've given you enough time so that you can lie on the floor and we're gonna lie on our back, starting lying on your back. Um, what I'd like for you to do is just find yourself comfortable and with your legs extended, your arms extended to the side, just so that your arms and legs aren't touching one another or touching another part of your body. Close your eyes, allow yourself to be supported by the floor, the earth beneath you. Relax your jaw, <laughs> draw your tongue away from the roof of your mouth, close your eyes. If you're not comfortable closing your eyes, just kind of lower your gaze or take your gaze inward. And now take your hands and place them on your belly and just notice your breath. Don't try to change it, don't alter it. Just notice how it is in its natural state without shaping it, without doing anything differently. Good. Now I want you to take a breath into your palms. So now when you take a breath, feel your belly expand into the palms of your hands like, like a balloon into your hands. And then as you exhale, draw your belly button back toward your spine. A little extra effort here. And breathing in and out of your nose, inhale. Feel your belly expand. Good, and exhale, pull back in. And just do that two more times. Inhale, expand. And exhale, draw back in. Good, now, if you are able to roll over onto your belly, I'm going to invite you to do that. If you are uncomfortable doing that, go ahead and stay where you are and just keep using your hands, but maybe you'll add a little bit of resistance. So once you roll over onto your belly, we're coming into the asana called makarasana or crocodile pose. So if you can imagine a crocodile, that's what you're creating here. So bend your arms at your elbows, take your fingers and place them on your opposite elbows and rest your forehead on your top forearm. So if you're wearing a watch and it's interfering with the forehead, maybe switch your arms so that there's nothing there. And you wanna make sure that your chest is elevated off of the floor. So there's no pressure or resistance on the chest, but the belly is pressing onto the earth, your hips, your thighs. And then take your feet a little wider than your hips and allow your toes to point out and roll your ankles in. This is the crocodile part. Good. And now we're gonna to continue to uh, exercise our diaphragm by, as you inhale, take that breath in, feel the belly expand and it's pressing. You'll feel that resistance pressing into the floor. And then as you exhale, draw your belly back again and inhale, expand and exhale, draw back in. And now I'm gonna ask you to notice the smoothness and depth of your breath. So when we talk about depth, we're not talking about an exaggerated breath. We want a breath that is complete and full. And when we talk about smoothness, notice if there's any jagged edges or um, maybe jumps in the breath. And often if we pay just a little bit more attention to those places in the breath, we'll notice that it'll start to smooth out a little bit more. 
good. And notice if there's any sound coming from the breath, maybe in the throat or the chest, any kind of restriction there might be affecting the smoothness and the depth of your breath. So see if you can quiet that. Um, if you're a yoga practitioner who has an ujjayi practice, I'm going to ask you to not bring that in just yet. Good. Now, notice the evenness of the breath. Notice the rhythm. We want an inhale that is seemingly the same length as the exhale and vice versa. So find your natural rhythm. Don't try to extend anything beyond what is comfortable. And if you're not sure of the rhythm, maybe assign a number to the length of the inhale and match the length of the exhale to it. Good. And then lastly, we want to look at the top of the inhale and the bottom of the exhale. And we wanna make sure that there's no pause, that there's no cease, that it is continuous and without pause. So I'd like for you to take three more breaths, deep, smooth, quiet, even and continuous. Now, if you are on your belly, without taking too much movement, just roll yourself over onto your back. And if you're on your back and you have been using the hands as resistance, take your arms by your side. And those of you who are rolling over, also take your arms by your side in a Shavasana or corpse pose. And with your eyes closed, just connect with the movement of breath in the belly now that that resistance is gone. And allow yourself to just ride that wave, that rhythm. Allow the mind to connect to that rhythm. Good, and without moving too quickly, go ahead and roll over onto your side left side preferably and then press yourself up to a seated position and again try not to move too quickly so that you don't lose this rhythm of this pattern of breath that you've established and return back to your chair and if you're in a comfy chair make sure that you move to the edge place your feet firmly on the floor and if your feet don't reach, maybe you can grab a book or something if you have to, so that they feel grounded. Lift and spread your toes and press the four corners of your feet into the floor, the inside ball, outside ball, outside heel, inside heel. Track your knees over your ankles. Sit up nice and tall and feel your shoulders coming aligned over your hips. Get in your ears over your shoulders and place your hands back on your belly and feel that movement. You inhale, expand, exhale, draw back in. Good, with the next breath you take, find a little lift in the chest. And then as you exhale, draw your shoulders onto your back, away from your ears. With your next breath in, find some length in the back of the neck. And as you exhale, draw your chin back slightly. Good. Now release your arms by your side. We're going to find movement with the breath. So do not adjust your breath to match your movement. The movement should match your breath. So as you breathe in, bring your arms up overhead. If you can, allow your palms to touch. And then as you exhale, turn your palms away. Sweep your arms down to your side. This is very simple, but not always. The idea is as you inhale, the movement of your arms length lasts for the length of the inhale. And as you release your arms down, the movement lasts the length of the exhale. 
So if something isn't off, adjust the arm movement. Again, do not adjust your breath. Inhale, sweep up. Gaze can look up if you like, if it's comfortable on your neck. Otherwise, keep your chin parallel to the floor. Exhale, swan dive down. Could take three more breaths in this way. Inhale, upward flowing motion. Exhale, downward flowing motion. Again, breathing in and out of the nose. Do one more round here. Come up. And to lower. Good. We're going to take one more breath to bring your arms up overhead. But this time as you exhale, release your arms over to your right side. So your right hand comes to your right hip and your left hand comes to the outside of your right thigh. Take a breath in, find length in your spine. And then as you exhale, turn to the right, just with the lower lumbar. Take another breath in, find length. Exhale, start to turn now with the thoracic spine. Take another breath in, find length. Now start to use the, bring the cervical spine into your twist. I'll take two more breaths. Just find subtle movement with the inhale and the exhale. Maybe only you can feel it, no one can see it. Good. Then inhale, bring your arms up overhead. Really reach, come out of your hips and then lower to the left. Left hand by left hip, right hand on left side. Take a breath in, find length. And exhale to turn. Inhale to find length. And exhale to turn. Inhale to lengthen. Exhale to twist. Good, take two more breaths. Find the subtle movements in your own body. Nice, take a breath in, sweep your arms up overhead. Good, and bring your arms back by your side. We're gonna bring our hands to our knees. And you wanna straighten your arms as much as you can and kind of cup your palms over your knees. And as you take a breath in, pull your heart and chest forward, drop your shoulders away from your ears, find a little arch. You can look up if you like, otherwise keep your gaze Steady, and then as you exhale, use your palms to press away as you round your back, bring your chin to your chest and belly button to your spine. You might know this as cat and cow. So inhale, coming into cow pose. Exhale, rounding out, coming into cat pose. So again, you're moving with the breath. Nothing else matters here. It doesn't matter how much you arch or how much you round, but really try to find this opposite articulation of the spine in your body. Good, let's take one more inhale. And one more exhale. And now come back to a comfortable seat. Go ahead and place your hands on your belly once more. Find your nice erect posture. Again, shoulders over hips, ears over shoulders. And close your eyes or lower your gaze and connect once more to the movement of the belly in your hands. Allow your mind to try to focus on nothing but this movement, this rhythm, this deep, smooth, even, continuous, quiet breath. Good, now rest your hands, palms down on your thighs. And the next breath you take, see if you can allow your awareness to rest in the crown of your head. So take a breath there. With the next breath you take, shift your awareness now to the center of your forehead, just for one breath. With your next breath in the center of the brow. Good. Take one breath with your awareness of the inner pockets of the eyes, your pockets of joy. One breath at the opening of the nostrils. One breath at the hollow of the throat. One breath out to the shoulders.
One breath in the back of the arms, the tricep area. One breath at the elbows. One breath at the wrists. One breath at your palms. Next breath at the tips of your fingers. And take one more breath with your awareness at the tips of your fingers. Now a breath at the palms. Moving back to the wrists. Elbows. Triceps. Shoulders. Back to the hollow of the throat. One breath, the heart center. One breath at the tip of the sternum. One breath at the navel center. One breath at the center of the pelvis. And one breath at the root of the pelvic floor, the perineum. Our place of stability in the body. Take one more breath in this space. Good. Working our way back up now with awareness in the center of the pelvis. The navel center. The tip of the sternum. the heart center, the hollow of the throat, opening of the nostril, the corners of the eyes, and space between the brow. In the center of the forehead. And with your next inhale, bring your awareness back to the crown of the head. But with your exhale, allow your awareness to flow down the bridge of your nose and out your nostrils. And now as you inhale, follow your awareness and the breath outside of the nostrils back to the center of the forehead down the bridge of the nose, out the nostril. Inhale from the nostrils back to the center of the forehead. Good, allow your awareness to flow between these two spaces and take five more breaths. After your fifth round, if you can allow your awareness to then collect and rest in the center of the forehead, you may start to notice that the mind wants to rest in this space. And it's home, Agya Chakra. Allow the mind to rest here. And if you find that it wants to wander, just learn to bring it back. It's like training a puppy. If you find difficulty bringing it back, maybe focus a little bit more on the sensation of the breath in the belly. Going back to your rhythm.
And now starting to deepen the breath a little bit more in the belly. Keeping your eyes closed, bring your palms together at your heart center. Rub your palms together to generate a little heat through friction. And then keeping your eyes closed, take your warm palms and place them over your eyes. Recognizing that we live both in an internal world and an external world simultaneously. Take a moment to reflect on how you feel in your internal world. And see if by opening your eyes into your dark, warm palms and drawing your hands away from your face, you can bring that feeling outwardly with you as well. Take a bow into your own heart space, just acknowledging yourself, the time that you've given yourself to train your breath, to connect your mind and your body and your body with your mind. And know that you have the power, <laughs> the brain has the power to change how you react to stress in the outside world so that you don't bring it to your inside world. And I thank you all so much for sharing your practice with me. And I hope that you will be the change you wish to see. We do have a few more minutes if anybody has any questions or anything that they want to put in the chat. Uh -huh. I love yoga. Is it really a way of life? Ariel, we were, I was saying that I was thinking about um, uh, Ted Lasso. Yoga is life. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jackie. Thank you, Karen. Um, Catherine, I don't think that I have anything else to add today. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, we'll be sending out the recording of both stress management webinars uh, later today, as along with the slides and some resources. Uh, so have a great day, everyone. Thank you all.